Welcome to Blade of Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. For the first time in almost seven months, and for the first time under the livery of a new military branch, the U.S. Space Force X-37B unmanned shuttle orbiter was lifted into orbit on May 17, 2020 from Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. The rocket that did the lifting was the United Launch Alliance Atlas V, the vehicle that was responsible for four previous X-37B launches before SpaceX's September 2017 Falcon 9 launch of the spacecraft. This is the 84th flight of the Atlas V rocket in ULA's 139th mission. The 501 is comprised of a common core booster powered by an RD-180 engine and a Centaur second stage powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10C1 engine. A Ruag 5-meter diameter payload fairing protects the X-37B orbital test vehicle during ascent. The Atlas V rocket stands about 60 meters or 20 stories and weighs about 346,000 kilograms or 760,000 pounds fully fueled. The launch was dubbed USSF-7 by the Space Force, although it is the second launch conducted under the auspices of the new military branch after the AEHF-6 launch in December. We covered the inaugural U.S. Space Force launch of AEHF-6 in episode 28. A link to episode 28 can be found below. The U.S. military has shown a preference for using ULA for classified missions rather than SpaceX, in spite of the fact that ULA launches are significantly more costly. The OTV-5 mission X-37B landed at NASA's Shuttle Landing Facility runway at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida in October of 2019. Since the retirement of the Space Shuttle in 2012, the X-37B is the only unpowered glide path re-entry space vehicle in operation based on the venerable Space Shuttle design. The October landing represented 779 days in orbit, a record for that space frame. There are two X-37Bs. It is not clear whether the X-37B used for OTV-6 is the same as used for OTV-5, or the sister spacecraft. Let's briefly take a look at the new X-37B launch, revisit its connections to the Space Shuttle, and discuss the future of reusable spacecraft in general. The X-37B is a classified spacecraft that runs classified missions. However, the Space Force, and the Air Force previously, usually reveals the unclassified portion of the mission to a public hungry for details on spaceflight in general. Like its larger brethren, the Space Shuttle-derived X-37B is expected to provide a means to bring cargo into orbit. OTV-6 is slated to release the U.S. Air Force Academy's FalconSat-8 Microsat, which is supposed to test communication and space propulsion technologies, provide a location in its hole for two NASA payloads designed to study the effects of space radiation on seeds and materials, and activate specially mounted test equipment that converts solar DC power to microwave energy to measure conversion loss. The Naval Research Lab is experimenting with the use of microwaves to project energy to drones and ground facilities from space. The Space Force has not indicated the mission duration of OTV-6, Although based on prior missions, it seems that likely a landing at Kennedy will not happen for one to two years from now. We'll keep you posted. In the late years of the shuttle era, NASA contracted with Boeing to design a scaled-down version of the famous orbiter for unmanned missions. The advantages of an unmanned orbiter were manifest. There was no risk of losing astronauts in the event of a catastrophic loss of space frame integrity like that experienced by the Challenger in 1986. The removal of a crew cabin and human workspace meant that the new orbiter could be smaller with a corresponding reduction in costs. A smaller orbiter could be lifted into space with a smaller and less expensive rocket than that used for the space shuttle, and turnaround time for a smaller unmanned orbiter would be much faster. NASA developed a design for an orbiter about one quarter in size of the shuttle during the four years it was in charge of the program following inception in 1999. In 2004, the X-37, as the new spacecraft was subsequently called, was transferred to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency as part of the U.S. Department of Defense's push for space capability independent of NASA. Between 2004 and 2006, DARPA ran suborbital test flights on an atmosphere-only prototype of the X-37, the X-37A. 
Tests of the X-37A eventually proved shuttle aerodynamics worked on a smaller airframe, and unmanned landings were successfully conducted during 2006. The U.S. military stepped in at this point and committed to build a space-worthy variant of the X-37A, designated as X-37B. The Air Force already designed and tested a prototype unmanned orbiter, the X-40A, in the late 1990s, but it was decided the X-37A was a more practical space frame. The Obama administration's intent to shutter the space shuttle program, launch cost considerations, and the X-37B's substantially smaller space frame meant that the spacecraft was designed to be lifted into orbit by an Atlas V rocket from the United Launch Alliance rather than the usual three-rocket setup of the space shuttle. Why does the Space Force need an unmanned space drone? There are a number of possibilities. Its form factor makes an ideal technology development platform for a much lower cost than the shuttle or the International Space Station. It will also be easier to conduct classified missions with a lower profile spacecraft. On a more speculative level, space interdiction of hostile orbital targets with the X-37 is certainly a feasible alternative to ground to space missiles. Also, with the exploration of the Moon and Mars by SpaceX, ULA and NASA an increasingly nearer possibility, the X-37 could also be used for space fighter development with an eye toward the Space Force eventually providing intrasolar system security. When NASA developed the original X-37, it never flew, in atmosphere or in space. After DARPA took over the X-37 program, their X-37A prototype was built and test flown bolted to the underside of a lift aircraft from scaled composites in June 2005, and then finally lifted and released for independent glide testing on April 2006. After the success of the first, two more glide tests were undertaken that year. Boeing was subsequently contracted to build two space-worthy craft based on the X-37A, designated as the X-37B. Build 1 of the X-37B was launched in April 2010, staying in orbit for 224 days. It landed successfully at the Kennedy Space Center, clearing the way for its sister craft to launch. Build 2 was launched in March 2011. That craft orbited for 468 days, more than twice the duration of Build 1, and landed at the KSC in June 2012. Each spacecraft was to make one more successful spaceflight apiece, Bill 1 in December 2012 for 674 days, and Bill 2 in May 2015 for 717 days. A fifth flight, Bill number unannounced, was launched in September 2017. It is this fifth mission that landed last October at the Kennedy Space Center. In 2011, at a conference of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Boeing proposed an upsized variant of the X-37B for use as a cruise service vehicle for the ISS. The X-37C would be about double the size of the X-37B and two-fifths the size of the space shuttle. The X-37C would offer a number of docking arrangements for the ISS depending on mission requirements and could hold up to six passengers and crew. In contrast, SpaceX's Crewed Dragon 2 to be test launched with astronauts in 2020 is expected to hold up to seven crew and passengers, while Boeing's crewed Starliner, likely to be test launched with astronauts in 2021, is configured for three passengers and crew. Given the availability of the SpaceX Dragon 2 and upcoming availability of the Boeing Starliner, there doesn't seem to be too much need for a crew service version of the X-37C, but given the limitations of the ISS as a spacecraft port, and the Earth-to-orbit-to-Earth -Earth capability of the X-37, a crewed variant seems to make sense as an early prototype for a space superiority fighter. It would not be surprising to see such a development if the Space Force is eventually authorized to act on it by Congress. We look forward to a perfect mission result for the X-37B OTV-6 mission, and to review what has transpired when it finally returns to Earth. Share what you think about the Space Force's space plane and the branch's efforts in general in continuing development of the Space Shuttle space frame by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this briefing on the USSF-7 launch and the background highlights of the X-37B. If so, click that like button. Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will also help you stay informed when new episodes are released. 
Links to previous space industry related episodes and our other content can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account, where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page, where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching. incredible military equipment uh, at a level that nobody's ever seen before. We have no choice. We have to do it with the adversaries we have out there. We have, uh, I call it the super duper missile. And I heard the other night 17 times faster than what they have right now. Then you take the fastest missile we have right now. Uh, you've heard Russia has five times and China's working on five or six times. We have one 17 times and uh, it's just gotten the go ahead. 17 times faster, if you can believe that, uh, General. That's something, right? 17 times faster than what we have right now. Fastest in the world by a factor of almost three. So I just want to congratulate everybody and thank everybody. Uh, space is going to be, uh, it's going to be the future, both in terms of defense and offense and so many other things. And already, from what I'm hearing and based on reports, we're now the leader in space. and that took place. Don't forget, we're having a meeting today. This is really to unfurl the flag, but we've been doing this now for quite a while. I have to say that from my standpoint, having a, uh, a force, a, a space force in this case, but to be adding to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which I've known about and read about and heard about all my life, just like General Milley to be the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is something that's a very special thing. Well, to add another force into the Joint Chiefs. And, uh, and we're getting a, uh, a four-star, in this case, we're getting a four-star general on your board. So we're doing something right here. So we're doing something that is such a monumental task. So it's been more than 72 years. The Air Force, I believe, was the last one. And so we have Air Force, and not since the Air Force has anything like this happened. And now we have Space Force added on uh, with uh, with full honors, I must add, with full honors. So today we're here for a uh, very important, it's really an important occasion because we're unfurling the flag. And with us is Chief Master Sergeant Roger Toberman. And he is, uh, I'd like you to say exactly, because his rank is a very special rank. Uh, tell us about that rank. Yes, sir. I'm the Senior Enlisted Advisor for the United States Space Force. And the highest. Uh, Highest sergeant by far, right? Yes, sir. There's and no at the moment, the only one. So I uh, give counsel to the secretary that's, that's and to the president. chief. Uh, this rank is custom designed. Wow, that's beautiful. Uh, wow, that's it. And he's the only, the only airman that wears that rank, and will be the only airman that wears that rank. He's the senior enlisted. That's leader. fantastic. And I heard tremendous things about you, Roger. Thanks. It's a very important position. Thank you. You're with all these generals, but you know what? He's an important guy, right? So why don't we go ahead and do it? Let's do it. Yes, please. Thank you. That's fantastic. Isn't that great? Please get in the picture. That's beautiful. Mr. President, you will stand in your office alongside the other service flags. Very, very great honor. It's a great honor. That's a beautiful flag, too. Roger, hold that up so they can see. That's really beautiful. Wow. It's a big, that's a big day. 
That's a big day. Can someone explain the logo, General Raymond? Please. Please. So the, the delta uh, in the middle is a symbol that the space uh, community has used for years and years and years. The North Star signifies our core value, our guiding light, if you will. And the orbit around the globe uh, signifies the space capabilities that fuel our American way of life and our American way of war. I'm going to do this for Roger. Here, yeah, Roger. Please don't put this on eBay tonight. <laughs> yeah, Roger. Come here, Roger. And we're going to sign. Okay. Roger. That's for you. Thank you so much. That's for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's do it. This is great stuff. Let's see. I have. I think we have no choice, right, General? Yeah, Come absolutely. on over here. Good luck. Thanks, Thanks. Good luck. Okay. Thanks for your, Fantastic. Thanks for and these are going for everybody. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you very much, Mark. You're all set. General, come on over here. General Kellogg's been fantastic, done a great job. He's working on a special project now, aren't you? Right? I am, sir. We're getting very, it done. Very special project. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I'll be going to Camp David tonight.